Good morning. Good morning. Since uh, Eddie is off on his little rendezvous, you get me. Lucky you. <laughs> All right. I, I'm going to read about in Luke 8, 42, the second half of that verse. It says, as Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. And he said, Who touched me? And they all denied it. Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me. I know that the power has gone out from me. Then the woman, seeing that she could go not unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed, healed you. Go in peace. Now this, for, this story is in the Bible three times from three different perspectives. And I'm going to quickly, because I know this is not a sermon, I'm going to quickly read you all the accounts because it, they all add to this story. In Matthew... Verse, uh, chapter 9, verse 20, it says, Just then, a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. And she said to herself, If I only touch his cloak, I will be healed. And Jesus turned and saw her. He said, Take heart, my daughter. He said, Your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed from that moment. And then in Mark 5, 25, his version was, and a woman who was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, she had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up from behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized the power had gone out of him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask, Who touched me? Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing that what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and said, Trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. I cannot imagine Jesus, the Son of God, not really knowing who touched him. But yet, for some reason, he asked, Who touched me? Why did he do that? He wasn't trying, I don't believe, to embarrass her. But why did he ask her who touched me I believe it was because he wanted a connection with her he wasn't going to let her just slide off to the side without connecting to her um, in Matthew it says that he saw her he turned around and he saw her and I looked up that word and I don't always do word studies but for some reason I wanted to know what that word meant and it means to see a seeing that becomes a knowing, such as, I see what you're saying, or I see what you mean. So when he turned around, he didn't just like physically see her, he saw her. And, and he made a connection, and he understood her need. Um, and then at the end, he called her daughter. And I think that's very significant. She had a condition that made her unclean. And it meant that everything she, she was unclean and everything she touched became unclean. And for her to be in a crowd of people that were crowding around Jesus and they're, they're mobbing him, I don't think she was the only person who wanted to touch him. I think everybody wanted to touch Jesus. Because there were a lot of people with needs. And so she just happened to, she touched him and she had the faith and that connected, and she received her healing. And um, he, 
he saw her as more than unclean. He turned around and he called her daughter, which means like the daughter of Abraham, which means that she's part of the family. So I just, that was one to uh, share that because I really believe that God desires connection with all of us every day. And he desires connection with us here in worship time. Um, sometimes we come through the week and we feel like kind of like that mob has been pressing in on us. And we come in all battered and we might even come in unclean. And, and God wants to look down and to reach out and to see us and to connect with us. And so when, when you worship him, um, like if you raise a hand, it's, it's to connect and say, you know, I, I want to be seen and I want to see you and he wants you to see me. And it's that connection. Thank you. So that's why we come together today, very simply, just to, just to remember that uh, God is here to connect with us. We're not here just to, to walk through a service or a ritual. We're not here to be religious. We're just here because we're unclean and we need a Savior. And, uh, and Jesus is that Savior this day. Uh, so let's spend some time just praying as we open up our service this morning. And then we'll sing some more and share some more around God's Word around his truth. Remember, if you will, the family of Marjorie Black, a graveside uh, service tomorrow uh, for her. Um, just curious, how many of you uh, in this place, uh, Marjorie, was she uh, either a co-worker at the school or your lunch lady? Uh, just, yeah, kind of cool, huh? Okay, so just, just remember her and her family tomorrow. And um, also, if you would, uh, be lifting up Chris Carson, um, going in for knee surgery on uh, October 28th, uh, a torn ACL. And so just be lifting him up. Uh, kind of disappointed about, about uh, football season. He's had a great season so far. But, uh, but more than that, just be lifting him up and, and uh, encourage him in that as well. So I uh, want to remind you of that. Uh, just received word this morning also, uh, just another member of our community, uh, Grace Chamberlain uh, passed away, so um, would you be remembering uh, that family this morning too? Um, so be remembering the Chamberlain family. Um, so another one of those neat Murray people that uh, been around for a long time that uh, blessed us in a lot of ways. So be thinking of those folks, but, but more than that, uh, just right now, let's bow for a word of prayer. Um, any, any other prayer requests maybe before I hurry on? Don't want to do that. Yeah, pray for Eddie and Megan. They're off traveling today, and uh, they're heading to this, uh, the mountains of Tennessee and, and going to be back next week. Just pray as God begins to bring their hearts together and, and wind their lives together as they come back to minister. Other prayer requests? Praises? Let's bow. Reach out. Connect with Jesus this morning. Our Father in heaven, we thank you this morning for calling us your sons and daughters and calling us to you. Uh, Father, this morning I just pray that uh, we've examined our lives and our hearts and we're here because we just want to pour out to you and we want to thank you and we want to receive from you. Uh, Lord, this day we, we just want to worship you and tell you how good you are. Uh, Father, help us, um, help us to drive away... Uh, the press of the crowds and the week that we've had and help us to focus on who you are. Um, Father, um, help us to understand uh, what it means to have a Savior who comes to us and wants to see us, wants to know us for who we are. So we lay all of that at your feet and we just, we just lift you up this morning and we're reminded how you love us. Lord, um, you love us with a longing for us uh, to lay down our pretense and uh, to, Father, just put our eyes on who you are and to be renewed by that. And we do so in Jesus' name. Amen.
You know the name of that song? Can you? Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Hey, if you have your Bibles, would you turn with me, please, uh, to the book of 1 John. We're looking at the fourth chapter today. And uh, as we begin to engage in God's Word, as we begin to dig in and dive in, I, I hope that you recognize that it's during this time that God is looking to make a, make a real connection with you. Um, not only does He want to connect with you through your worship and praise, uh, not only does He want to connect with you through, a ti- through times of prayer where you speak and listen to Him, uh, not only does He want to connect with you around His, his table, uh, remembering His body and His blood broken for you, He wants to connect with you through His Word and through His truth. Now, let me tell you something as you're getting there to 1 John, uh, the fourth chapter. We're going to be looking at the 1st through the 6th verses today. Uh, let me tell you something. We talk a lot about faith in church, correct? Right? Uh, but do you understand, as John begins to, to share in this book about authentic faith, do you understand where he begins before he ever gets to talking about what real faith lived out looks like in this world? and beyond this world, he talks about the truth. Remember, he talks about Jesus. He said, we've seen the truth. We've touched the truth. We've heard the truth. With our own eyes, we saw the truth. And John says that it all begins with the word of truth. So give me Jesus. And that's our prayer today as we step into God's word. Um, there There are a lot of truths out there in our world, and I think that's why so many people struggle struggle with real faith. And so today, I want to invite you very simply to engage in the truth in your life. Let's be honest. Some days you have your truth and and I have mine and we can talk about, about that truth is okay for you, but my truth is okay. And let's throw all that out the window and let's just say we're going to build our lives as a church based upon the truth of Jesus Christ. Not according to Brian McCracken, not according to anybody else, but very simply, let's just commit as a body of believers that we're going to base our lives on God's truth. Amen? So let's look at it. Today, we're encouraged. Isn't that interesting that God encourages us to to look at that truth, to test that truth, but to do it authentically, letting it shape you rather than you shaping it? It's so important that we learn to test God's truth authentically in our life because in every situation we're in, we're going to have to decide what God's will is for you. And you can only do that, Romans tells us, by renewing your mind. And that renewing your mind is committing to God's truth first and casting your own ideas out the window and just simply relying on who He is. So let's do that today as we we step into 1 John. I want want you to look at what it means to authentically test the truth. And I want to give you some guidelines for that and, and why we do that in Scripture. So young people, middle, here's the chairs again, right? So young people, if you're kind of middle of the road, if, if you're old, guess which chair I sat in today? I sat in this chair today, all right? After being up till 11 o'clock at a wedding last night, I feel like this chair today, all right? Last week, I don't know if you noticed, but I sat in the, I, you noticed that? I sat in this little chair. You know why I did that? My legs don't dangle when I sit in that chair. That's why I sat, okay. So you got your version, I got mine. But let's listen to God's version in 1 John, the fourth chapter, all right? Dear friends, I love the way John starts that off. So before we do anything else, all right, so, so just so we're engaged, look at somebody that you didn't come to church with this morning and just say, hey, you're a dear friend of mine, okay? So let me do that real quick. So that's the scope of this. John, John begins to put that in context. Okay? So here we are, dear friends. John says it. And he says, 
Don't believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Are you hearing? Because many prophets have gone out, gone out into the world. And this is how you can recognize. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Man, if that doesn't get your attention today, I don't know what will. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge that Jesus is not from God, this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you've already heard is coming and even now is already in the world. So don't, don't freak out. It's been around for a while. You dear children, okay? I love John. You dear children are from God. And before John even knows a thing about you, he says, if you're connected with Christ, what does he say? You've overcome them. Why? Because you're a nice person. Because you're good. Because you came to church today. That's not what God is saying here. You do children for God and have overcome them because the one who is, the one, catch this, the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. How many of you this week have gotten oppressed, have gotten anxious, have gotten twisted around, have gotten messed up in this world? Been there? Remember, greater is the one who's in you than the one who's in the world. Listen to this. It says, they are from the world and therefore speak with the viewpoint of the world. And guess what? The world listens to them. You... I'll pause there again. Put your finger on that, and I want to pause there again. Do you recognize they say a lot of things? I mean, they say they say almost everything, and 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 if they attach the word scientist to it, it's like oh, yeah. They say a lot of things, and guess what? The world listens to them. But this is what God is calling you out of. He says, we are from God. And whoever knows God listens to us. The us John is talking about there is, is the apostles and their teaching. And their teaching focused on who and what? Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Savior and the Lord, right? That's what it focused on. The good news of the gospel, that's what it focused on. Because have you found a whole lot of good news in this world lately? Hey, the good news is Jesus is, is truth. And you can put your faith in him when you accept his truth and lay aside your own. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. And this is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. Let that fall on your heart for a little while. Let's soak in, and let's pray, and let's ask God to walk us through this, all right? Let's pray. So, Lord, I just ask that uh, today um, that we don't look at this with, with earthly eyes. And, Father, um, we open up our hearts to hear your word and allow your truth to set us free. I recognize everybody comes in this room today with different situations in their life, and sometimes we allow our situations to dictate our truth, but Lord, help us to recognize that you are the way, the truth, and the life. And we, don't get, we don't get anywhere, and we don't get closer to you unless we accept that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So help us to accept his word and his teaching. And Father, today help us uh, to understand how important, how important it is to know the truth and to use it as a test for everything we walk through and everything you bring us to. So that one day, Father, we might stand before you and hear the words, hey, I know you. You're mine. Well done, good and faithful servant. Lord, help us to be faithful in a world that's clamoring for success and recognition. Help us just to be faithful. In Jesus' name, amen.
So James Marshall, you know what he's famous for? Anybody, any historians in here know James Marshall? I love the blank looks on your faces. Um, James Marshall, okay? I, I, and, and it's unfair. I have this advantage because actually, you know, I did some study on this. James Marshall was the first man to discover gold in California in 1848. He spawned the gold rush and a group of people that end up be call, being called the 49ers, yeah, who followed him. And um, this guy, uh, James Marshall, also used the ch used a term that we don't use much anymore in our world. Uh, when he found gold, you know what he you know what he would exclaim, and many of the 49ers would follow his example. You know what he exclaimed? Eureka! All right, yeah, you didn't say Eureka. Uh, he, he was like Eureka, which means I found it, right? Um, and uh, other prospectors learned that. Very simply, as they rushed out to California, that everything that glittered, right? Everything that glittered was not necessarily gold. Wow. So, there was also, besides real gold in California, there was what was called fool's gold. Have you ever found a uh, pyrite? If you ever hiked in the mountains of Colorado, later on they found gold in Colorado. If you ever find it, it's very common uh, in the streams of Colorado. You know, you find this glittering substance in there and you dive in that icy cold water and you think that you're going to be rich and you come out and they have this substance called iron pyrite, which is in fact called fool's gold. Oh, you're with me. Thank you for engaging this morning. Um, so this morning uh, we learned that we have to be careful to be able to distinguish between something that's not real and something that is, right? So experienced miners could usually determine uh, pyrite from gold. Some people could do it by simply just looking at it, right? And, and you've done that before. You said to yourself, you're confident in your own abilities. You said, I can tell just by looking at it. Have you tried that one and then you got it home? <laughs> I can tell just by looking at this vehicle that this is a gem. And you drive it in your driveway and you turn off the key and it goes clunk, 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 clunk. Pow! Right? That sounds like my vehicle anyways. And what they found out is there are several tests. Sometimes there's the eye test. Some experienced miners could tell the difference between real gold and fool's gold that way. Um, others involved, you know, how do you test gold? Remember, you ever seen that? Yeah, the bite test. Because uh, even though, though gold is very dense, it's softer, it's softer than fool's gold. And fool's gold is harder. Um, another, another test, maybe you didn't know this, involves scraping a rock on a piece of white stone or ceramic, maybe pottery. Now, if you straight, if you straight, if you scrape gold on a piece of white pottery, what do you expect to see? Yeah, kind of a yellowish, goldish color on that pottery. But you know what happens if you scrape that same gold-colored pyrite on a piece of ceramic? What you get? A scratch, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're good. Thank you, Captain Obvious. Um, but let's take it. But also, I want to show you that, that there's even a more telling tale sign here. All right? Um, if you scrape pyrite on a piece of ceramic, it comes off blackish green. Isn't that weird? You know, you'd think it, and isn't it weird that that's the way God designed, God designed it? And, you know, and if there is a design, maybe we ought to believe in the designer, right? Okay, so that teaches us something. So spiritually speaking, spiritually speaking, Christians often find ourselves in similar positions every single day, having to determine is this God's will, is this God's truth in my life, or is this just something that I feel? Or is this something, just something that I'm going through that, that kind of uh, twists me and turns me? Is this truth, or is this something that's counterfeit? Like Christians need to be, be very wary of spiritual fool's gold. It, it's out there in our world, folks. We can't accept something as true without first testing it. And John tells us very simply, we can't accept something to be true without first testing it to see if it meets with God's approval. Then if it fails the test, 
we as Christians should discard and move on from that which is false to grow in the truth. Does that make sense? To grow in the truth of what God's desire is for us. Does that make sense? Am I connecting with you all here? I'm just, I'm just wondering because this is really important stuff. If it passes the test in keeping with God's word, we need to embrace what God teaches us wholeheartedly, even if it hurts, even if it doesn't feel right, even if I don't like it. We need to embrace God's truth so that we can move on and grow in a life with Jesus Christ. So what happens, let me ask you this question, what happens if we fail to be discerning? Let's use the grocery, mar- let's use the grocery store test, all right? So if we fail to be discerning, we as Christians, we go into the grocery store and uh, we think we got a pretty good eye and we're just picking out stuff, right? What happens if we fail to be discerning? You pay too much, all right? Yeah. And guess what? Spiritually, can you afford the price tag? I mean, the choice is between with God, with God forever or without God forever. That's the choice. God doesn't have to send you to hell. You, you, you get to choose it. Be discerning. Price tags a lot. What, happen, what else happens? You go in the grocery store and you're not discerning. You're just indiscriminately throwing things in your cart. And you get home. What do you find out? Ah, maybe you have some rotten fruit there. You should have tasted the grapes. You're not supposed to do that? Oh. Bite the apple and put it back. No, I didn't like that one. Okay, okay, probably don't. But, you know, there's other ways of getting around that, right? All right? <laughs> Keep going. This is good. I like this. What else is happening here? What else? What's that? Ah, the Charmin test, right? <laughs> squish your bread a little bit. What do you find out if you squish it a little bit? Oh, okay, squish bread, write this down, squish bread is no good anymore, but apple pie was really good last week, Julie, thank you very much. So, um, yeah, you know, you can, if you just indiscriminately throw things in your cart and you don't place them where they belong, your bread can end up squished and, and your kids don't like squished bread, do they? It, Elliot, we, no squished bread even, okay. Not even. So think about that for a minute. If you just throw the eggs in the bottom of the cart and then you put the frozen turkey on top, what do you got? (laughs) Scrambled eggs, yeah, yeah. Crunchy scrambled eggs, so it's all good. And think about that. If Christians, if we don't, if we aren't discerning, if we aren't discerning, we end up with a big mess, right? Hey, folks, listen, let's, let's incorporate this and get into our lives. Discernment requires Using the brain that God gave you to think, right? It, it does. And only those Christians who, who know God's word and, and think about it, and I want to use this word carefully, but think about it critically. You know, you know what Amy taught us this morning? That sometimes if you see a word in scripture that makes you kind of do this, look it up and think about it critically. What does it mean? So that you can, you can gain a, a gem from God's truth that can really, truly alter your life. If we don't know our Bible and think about it criti- critically, we, we can't recognize false teachers and their teaching. When that happens, folks, put your seatbelts on because when we, when we ingest, I'm going back to the grocery store here, when we ingest stuff, that is contrary to God's design for us, our world will fall, fall out of kilter. Now, recognize this. It doesn't change the character of God. God is still greater than he is in the world. And guess what? He can put your life back together, but it will fall apart for a while. It'll happen. It doesn't matter how nice you are. It doesn't matter how good you are. It doesn't matter how often you go to church on a given Sunday. But if we ingest what the world has to offer, guess what we receive in return? You may receive some of what the world ha- the best the world has to offer. But guess what? The best that this world has to offer 
cannot compare to what God offers. Amen? So the apostle knew his readers were under attack from false teachers. Okay? As a safeguard, he commands them to test those who claim to teach the truth. He gave us a couple of reasons for why that teaching is crucial and some guidelines for how it should be conducted. So he lays out a strategy for us, and I, and I like that because it's not just, this is just, just isn't something out there that you can't put your hands on. So let's walk through this. The first thing is a command to test, all right? Um, a command to test. So we're commanded. 1 John 4.1 says, Beloved, don't believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see where they're from God. Why? For many people have gone, many false prophets have gone out in the world. So John discusses very simply right here at the beginning. He says, it's the work of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Remember it. What is one of the things that the Holy Spirit is supposed to, supposed to accomplish in your life, help you with in your life? Jesus tells us in the book of John that he guides us into all truth. All right? So make sure that you're listening to God's word and God's Holy Spirit in your life. We've talked about that. That, that combination of those things is what helps inspire us towards an authentic faith. But it starts with the truth. And John makes this transition. He makes this comparison of the Holy Spirit and unholy spirits in false teachings and their false in false teachers and their false teachings authentic authentic Christians have to be careful to examine every spiritual message check this out they encounter if you have your Bibles turn to 1st Thessalonians the fifth chapter um, and I want to just remind you in the book of Acts verse 17 11 before we get there Acts 17 11 talks about a group of people, the Berean Jews. And, and the Bible says about these people, they were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica. For they received the message of God with great eagerness, which is great, you know. It's easy to listen to a good short sermon, right? <laughs> but it's a whole different thing than to take what you've heard and then examine the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. Hey, folks, if, if they needed to examine to see if what Paul said was true, you got double work to do when you go home today, all right? Double, triple, quadruple, all right? So, so we're commanded to test, test the spirits. And what we're talking about here is to see whether, whether these spiritual truths that we live by are from the Spirit of God or whether they're from the Spirit of Satan, who is called the Prince of this world, by the way. Isn't that interesting? 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 5, and I'm going to go ahead and just read a few extra verses to you. It says, and we urge you, brothers, starting with verse 14, admonish the idle, okay? If you're slacking in your personal time in God's word, I'm admonishing you not to be idle, all right? Encourage the faint-hearted, Hey, if you're hurting because you're not perfect, guess what? You're in the right place. We're all striving together. Be patient with them all. Hey, we're not here to crucify sinners. Jesus Christ was crucified once and for all for sinners, and that's enough of that crucifixion stuff. We're here to grow together in Christ. Be patient with all. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, okay? Hey, but they did it first. <laughs> they had it coming to them. The Bible says, See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always. Woo! Pray without ceasing. We know that one, right? Give thanks in all circumstances. Now you've just gone and done it. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Don't quench the spirit. In other words, hey, are you listening to what God's teaching you through his word, through his spirit? Don't quench the spirit. Don't despise prophecies, but test everything. There it is, the command, but test everything. And then when you've looked at it and you've tested it, hold fast to what is good. Not what you think is good, but what God says is good. 
Abstain from every form of evil. I got to work on that. How many of you have ever had a computer virus? Have you? They stink. <laughs> Why are you pointing at your husband when I ask you if you have a computer virus? Oh, okay, all right. So, <laughs> hey, remember, computer viruses are a lot like false teaching. They are. You know why? They destroy what is valuable, don't they? They intentionally, this is what computer viruses do, they intentionally pump error into the world to deceive and destroy people. And God says, test everything. Test everything. Second thing is a reason to test. Let's move on quickly here. A reason to test. Why, what's the reason? Because every spirit is not from God. Many false teachers have gone out in the world. Okay, so this word test, how many of you like that word, by the way? <laughs> I hated tests in school. Actually, I'd rather do a test than do homework. Anybody with me on that? Okay, I mean, I'd just rather take a test. It's, you know, we're there, we're here, let's do something. Let's take a test. Don't send me home with work to do. Um, just take a test. Sorry, teachers, I support you 100%. Homework is great, kids. Do your homework, okay? That was close. Uh, okay, this word translated test refers to the way a metallurgist uh, looks at metals to see if they are pure or not. And, and John says very simply that we're to continually test the spirits to see whether they're from God. If you go to buy jewelry and you find out later that that piece of jewelry you bought was junk, how are you going to feel? Yeah. Have you ever done that? I went, down to, uh, I went down to Mexico one time. We were in San Diego. We crossed the border into Tijuana, Mexico, man. Uh, and it was a great place, lovely cultural place. Crossed the border, and uh, down there they had all these wonderful shops. They would literally sell you anything, even, even diamond rings. And I had a girlfriend at the time. This is confession time for the preacher. Nothing compar in comparison to the wonders and the beauty and the amazing wife that I have today. But I had this girlfriend at one time, and in Tijuana, Mexico, for like 15 bucks, I could buy her a real diamond ring. <laughs> I was 16 years old at the time, and I was like, yeah, yeah. real diamond. Go back, put on the girlfriend's finger. She was so excited. I said, sweet, this is a real diamond ring. I mean, I'm not asking you to marry me or anything like that, but I just want you to know, this is a real diamond ring. Three days later, she says <laughs> at school to me, she says, uh, she says, real diamond ring, huh? I went home, took a shower, and this thing turned green on my finger, and, <laughs> and that rock fell out on the ground and just shattered to pieces. Real diamond ring. You know who I was blaming at that point? Those dirty south of the border people. Man, terrible. It wasn't their fault. You know, I was not discerning. I was not thinking. God says, test the spirits. Continually evaluate to see if it's for real. Determine in your life whether you are actually following God's word or some cheap replica. Do it. The reason is, the reason is because your eternity is at stake. That's the reason. Do you realize that God wants more than anything to spend eternity with you in a perfect place? And he has made it so, so wonderfully amazing and simple. If you'll accept his son Jesus with all your heart, all your soul, with all your mind and strength, if you'll accept him, very simply follow his desires that make your life better, that's, that's basically what he wants. He wants you to know him and be known by him. And he's given you, he's given you himself, he's given you a picture of himself. And uh, I, I heard, heard my son say this yesterday, I had to really think about it. He said, do you realize that, that this is, and he didn't say it in these terms, but this is how I translate it. So do you realize this is God's guide to him? about him for dummies. 
That he took scripture and, and he poured it out through his spirit through, through average people like you and me so that we could grasp and touch the hem of God's garment and see how good he is. And he's done that for us. And the reason to test is that there are people that want to twist that around for their own means and their own goods. They, they want to make a livelihood out of it. They want to make money out of it. They want, to, they want to make fame and a career out of it. God says, evaluate. Evaluate what you see and you hear. And read to determine if what you're living for originates from the Spirit of God or alternatively from, from deceiving demons who wish to destroy you. And so if you look at the tests in Scripture, you can look at Deuteronomy, the 13th chapter and, and the 18th chapter, and they still apply today. You see, here's the deal. False prophets oftentimes claim to receive a revelation outside of what God has already given to us. Prophets who proclaim the truth rely on God's word first and foremost. Remember that. If, if you hear someone that says, I have a revelation that God has never revealed to anyone before. Turn on, turn on <laughs> your filter. And by mean, what, what I mean by that is take God's word and go like this. Okay? And think about it in your life. Now, in Matthew 7, John remi reminds us, in Matthew 7, uh, John reminds us that many false teachers, if you turn there to, to Matthew, the 7th chapter, the 15th and 20th through 20th verses, John reminds us that many false teachers have gone out in the world. Matthew, Matthew reminds us the same thing. In J Matthew 7, 15 through 20, it says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You'll recognize them. Catch this. Underline this. This is for later on the test. <laughs> You'll recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Now, in Jesus' day, this was a real laugh line. Okay? It's irony. And Jesus plays on it. And Jesus, when people finish laughing in this part of his sermon, Responds, so every healthy tree bears good fruit. Nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown in the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. So Jesus teaches his disciples that they have to be wise and discerning because prophets will come into their midst. Historically, I don't know if you have ever read this, but historically a prophet would... Dis would uh, show himself by wearing a wool jacket, okay? Priests had one kind of garment. Prophets had another kind of garment. They wore this wool jacket. It's kind of like a, a sweater vest thing. You know how that was cool for a while? Remember those sweater vest things? Fashion moves on. So these guys had a wool garment, and, and Jesus is making this distinction. He says, false teachers, they may be wearing the garment, okay? They may... They may have the collar, they may have the vestments, they may have the robes. He says false teachers will do that, but they aren't coming for the right reasons. They're described here as a wolf in sheep's clothing. That's where this, that, that phrase comes from. And God says even every prophet that dresses up like a prophet needs to be tested. And if we ignore the Lord's warning to do so, we do it to our own harm. See, there are many powerful voices clamoring for attention. And you know where Jesus' warning starts? It starts right here in the church. There's a lot of people in the church that want to just be heard. So it's imperative that we practice discernment. Now, I was going to tell you, I'm going to move on quickly because I think I was going to tell you a story about fire ants. But if you do a Google search, Google search how they kill fire ants because this is really cool. Long and short of it is they, they sprinkle some poisonous food outside their, their house and the worker ants carry it inside, feed it to their queen. And the workers, the queen dies and so no more workers are produced. And after a little while, guess what? The whole ant hill is gone, dead. 
Wow. Think about that. This is how it works with false doctrine. If we last, lack discernment to import it into the heart of the church, we end up dead. Now let's get to the last thing. This is really important, okay? So let's finish up here with the last point. How do we do it? How do we discern? How do we discern what God's truth is? I want to give you three things, and I just want to, I want to give them to you really quickly here if I can. And so if you have your, if you have your outline, if you have your, if your outline inside, you have these for you, and I'm just going to walk through them really quickly. Here's the three things that John says to test when you're testing the spirits. He says, what do you believe about Jesus? What do you believe about Jesus? Hey, folks. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, God's anointed Messiah. I, I believe that he is both the Son of God and God himself in flesh. How about you? Is that the focus of your heart and your life? Do you understand that there was a group of people early in Christians, Christianity that didn't believe that Jesus was actually human? They had a hard time. They struggled with that. They didn't have, they didn't believe, they, they believed that Jesus was God, but they didn't believe he was actually human. And today, what do we struggle with? We have a hard time believing that Jesus was actually God in our world today, don't we? Isn't it interesting what we struggle with? But the truth is that Jesus was both God in flesh and human in every way and tempted in every way that we are. Test those spirits. The second thing is very simple. How do you behave as a result? Answer that question honestly. You know, I, I desire, I really desire to adhere to God's word and to base my life upon his truth. I don't always do it perfect. But I hope in the end the fruit of my life will prove, will simply display the grace of God, the forgiveness of God, the truth and the justice of God and who he is. If God hasn't changed the way that you act in some way, test, test. And then here's the last thing that John teaches us. And, and if, if, you, if you get nothing else, I hope you hear this. Let me ask you a question. What do you love to listen to? What do you love to listen to? You know, I don't know what the program, if we could go out to your car right now, what would your radio stations be programmed to? Uh, what do you love to put into your life? And, and John says, listen, if you know the truth of God, you're going to listen to the truth of God. But if you have no appetite for the word of God, it says a lot about your spirit. Hey, folks. God says very simply, if we're to have authentic faith, before that it can ever happen, we have to have authentic truth in our life, and we have to be able to test and know what that truth is. And John gives us some really practical ways to discern that. Because God was speaking directly to John, and, and we see the fruit of his life, and we, and we know that he served Jesus and loved Jesus with all his heart. Because John was changed. He was literally changed. He was literally changed from a son of thunder to a beloved disciple. How about you? Today we're going to sing a song of invitation. It's a really simple chorus, and you've probably learned it a long time ago. Maybe around camp. If you went to camp like I did, we sang this song. And, and around the campfire late at night, somewhere out in the wilderness, the mosquitoes were humming and buzzing, and, and all sorts of things were going on. But, but this song would play. And, and it would kind of change the atmosphere a lot of times. It's just simply entitled, I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you. All my heart rejoices. So we're going to ask you to sing that with us. Why don't you stand and sing that. And if you need to make a decision about who Jesus Christ is in your life, we invite you to come during this song and, and lift your life to God. We invite you to talk to somebody here today and, and begin the journey of what it means to follow Christ in your life. But let me encourage you right now, not to finish, but to engage and to worship God, to touch the hem of the garment.
today. Let's sing it together. Thank you.